It's so weird hosting hosting one of these things and then so I think we're live now. Um, but the uh, but it's not so. Uh, David was another guy at the Ross School who I really wanted to have on this call, um, but he's not here, so that is fine. Zach, why don't we just start with introductions? Um, Zach, do you want to go first? Okay, uh, my name is Zach Dowell. I'm an instruct. I'm on the faculty at Folsom Lake College, a community college in Folsom, California. I'm an instructional technologist. I help other faculty design and develop instruction, and also deploy innovative things in the classroom. And, and the big project I've been working on over the last year is to uh, working with a geosciences professor to employ quadcopters and unmanned aerial fixed-wing vehicles and now open ROV in the service of geosciences, imaging, remote sensing, and GIS. Bam. So that's awesome. Uh, Andrew, do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm Andrew Thaler. Um, I'm formerly of Duke University Marine Lab, uh, currently a freelance deep sea ecologist, uh, and I'm looking at ways to do low cost oceanographic work. So, things like ROVs, sensor arrays, things that can be kind of built DIY but can still be used for scientific research and also outreach. Yeah, awesome. Cool. And Benoit, do you want to say something? Yeah, sure. I'm um, I'm a French uh, fr freelance developer. And um, I'm uh, using Open RRV for my personal project of exploration. And as I'm also a teacher uh, in some engineering school, I was interested in knowing more about how we could use Open RRV in the edu as an educational material. That's great, awesome. And so the the other person is David Morgan, who's a, a teacher at the Ross School, and here he is. Hey, we can't hear you. I think your microphone might be muted. Your computer might be muted. How about now? All yeah, right. there we go. All right. So, I'm Dave Morgan. These are a few of my students. Nate, hey guys. Harrison, <laughs> Urban should be here in a few minutes. Cool. So, um, you, as it, the point of this call, I really just wanted to to start a discussion because we end up having this all the time. It's from educators who are like, "Hey, I really want to get this in the classroom, develop some curriculum around it." And there was a bunch of people. There's a, a number of people who have started kind of working on this stuff. Zach is a perfect example. So I really just wanted to do this um, this call just to get the discussion started and and really kind of hear what people are already doing and maybe brainstorming about some some different ideas that we can do going forward to kind of coordinate and help help each other out. Maybe create something together that is better than we we could have done separately. So Zach, I, I'd like to start with you, just kind of talking more about the. The do look down and and the and the work that you're you're already doing for the geosciences. Okay, well, uh, I'll start with a a real brief. We have a local company called Parallax. They make the propeller chip and a lot of sort of robotic stuff. And they're right over the hill here in Rockland, uh, 20, 25 minutes from here. And I went over there one day when they were starting their uh, quadcopter platform, which they call the Elevate. And it hit me all in a moment of. Uh, uh, like a, a bolt of lightning that that we should be using this for custom imaging for the geosciences. So I wrote up a proposal. I found a champion. Uh, the way I work is I find champions within departments who are willing to you know spend a bunch of time doing stuff that may or may not work. And uh, and so we got some kits in. We started flying and then looking to see how we could expand that program while backing into how we can um, come up with the educational and and sort of um, activity processes to get the images into the GIS, for instance, and uh, and then I saw y'all at Maker Fair, I guess last year, and talked to you a bit, and um, thought that that would be a great addition to our um, imaging capabilities, as well as you know expanding into things like um, uh, water sampling and all that other kind of stuff. Um, we have a local, so so I got a kit and I'm working on, it. I'm building it out and. I started to say how hard it is for institutions to get stuff. So the idea that I have to try and get these batteries from Hong Kong is is close to impossible uh, in my institution. Um, uh, so that's just maybe a side note. It's really yeah. hard. So I'm I was paranoid to start the project because I was if I screwed up the acrylic, you know, it would be close to impossible for my institution to like 
engaged to get more acrylic. You know what I mean? No, I it's really, really hard. <laughs> also, um, the, the batteries, um, don't, you don't actually have to just get them from Hong Kong. If you're willing to pay like $2 more, you can get them directly from Amazon. I'll send you a link right now. Yeah, I guess I meant more getting anything with a credit card is close to impossible at my yeah, that makes which sense. is how everyone works in the kind of, I'm out there on the edge of kind of you know buying stuff that is not the custom the institutions accustomed to buying things from state sponsored vendors and approved vendors and stuff so well um, don't hesitate to uh, reach out or post it on the forums or whatever because we'll that, that would be a stupid reason for anything <laughs> so just let me know about any of that um, so I've, I've documented just one thing, and I'll, I'll stop talking. I docu I've documented everything about the project. In fact, I'm also uh, filming the entire build, and I'm going to do it oh, super great. speed. So I have a camera oh, up above cool. my workstation. So I've filmed every single moment, or pretty close to every single moment of the build, and I'm going to put that together in like a 15-second video. So. That's the, the, the thing we need the most uh, help with is thorough documentation, because we, we've been making videos almost every day now, several videos a day of different aspects of it, but there's still bits that we're missing out, and there's still things that we're maybe taking for granted. And so, like, seeing someone else building it and whatever challenges you have and stuff, that's extremely valuable, because that's direct feedback that we can incorporate into doing the instructions better and doing the documentation better. Cool. So, so that's me. That's my project. I put the link there. Um, and then I want to, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to hog, I promise. But there's one other project that's been going on in this county for a long time. It's called Watershed Education Summit. I'll put the link in there. And it's a we have a lot of lakes and reservoirs around here, so I, I have the uh, I don't have to deal with salt water, which is nice. Um, and I'll just put the link here, and y'all can look at that. But it's a they take high school kids up to sample water and do all kinds of and count caddisfly larvae, etc. So I'm I'm looking to partner with them as well to kind of bring maybe bring the open ROV out once they're out in the field to just you know do some cool stuff. And I'll stop talking to them. Thank you. That's awesome. So uh, I I'd love to to move the conversation over to Andrew. You've worked with the Jason project. You've, you've brought in these, some of these bigger ROVs into schools. Can you talk a little bit about that and like what you learned and what you think the best practices are for, for that stuff? Or like what was really cool or what could be cooler, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, most of my work's been with ISIS, actually, the, um, the UK's ROV. I was out in the uh, Cayman Rise with them in January. Uh, and so most of what we do is we have we, we had pretty high bandwidth while we were we were out at sea and we were able to um, to Skype into school groups to to kind of give them a tour of the the facilities to sort of show them what was going on an oceanographic expedition and then we were able to um, mostly just upload uh, images and video um, through Twitter and every other possible medium we could get our hands on that wasn't terribly high bandwidth um, and just sort of kind of engaging anyone who was interested in following along. Uh, there's also, there's currently the, um, so Rhode Island has the Inner Space Center, which goes out with the Okeanos Explorer. That's the, um, the, that's the big um, NSF ship that's got the, uh, I think Nereus is on it right now, um, or Nereus might be on Schmidt's boat, the Falcor. Uh, one of the, uh, there's, there's two cruises out right now and, and two robots. I can't remember which robot's on which boat. But um, the Inner Space Center um, puts a live feed up of everything going on. I'll, I'll see if I can pull up that feed right now. Um, and it's, it gives you a, kind of a live, if they've got an active ROV going, you get a live uh, feed of the seafloor. Um, if they've got the AUVs going, um, it kind of just updates as, as you go and, and you get kind of a direct feed to the control van. But um, there, there's some really cool stuff going on with the uh, the big ROVs, but I'm really interested in getting um, smaller ROVs into the hands of people who may not necessarily have access to kind of these big um, facilities. So my, my primary research site's in Papua New Guinea, um, and I, I'm really excited about trying to bring um, a bunch of kits out to, to P&G the next time I go, uh, partner with someone at the University of Papua New Guinea, and um, kind of have their, their undergrad and graduate students build up a few of the of the robots and then use them for the research because um, there's a lot of stuff going on in relatively shallow water out there and I think it'd be great for them to um, uh, get their hands on on something they can do. And you know, wouldn't it be cool if like the, the classrooms that get it there, that they could connect with um, like Dave's classroom in New York. I mean, I think that, that that's like the, the real potential here is, is not just, you know, one RLB like the or whatever broadcasting to a few different classrooms is, is you know, classrooms each with their own RO, set of ROV is going out and asking questions in their local um, areas and then sharing that with, with other classrooms. 
around. Yeah, I mean that kind of stuff would be fantastic. Um, developing countries have other issues involved with that because there's there's infrastructure and bandwidth issues. Sure. Um, so it's hard to get video feeds out and, and stuff like that if you're broadcasting from an island in Papua New Guinea. But um, it's getting better all the time. Um, there's some places like Port Moresby where their their internet connections better than what I'll get in Beaufort, North Carolina. <laughs> so why don't we go to the, the, the classroom before we go to what Benoit is doing in, in France. What, Dave, what are, what are you guys thinking? What is your, what is your big dream and hope for, for Open RV and, and for what you guys can do? Here, here at the Roswell, we're actually starting a pretty big marine science initiative. Um, uh, the founder of our school is actually currently uh, on a round-the-world voyage on a yacht that's been outfitted with a Seakeeper system um, that's transmitting or starting in a couple of months is going to start transmitting a live feed of, uh, of oceanographic uh, marine science data back to the school. So we're going to have this sort of remote source of data, and what we're looking to do is connect that to a local source of data here on Long Island Sound. Um, we're out sort of in the tip of Long Island, so we have uh, access to both the north and the south uh, shores of Long Island. Um, and, uh, and so we're hiring a full-time marine science teacher next year. Uh, we're offering three new electives in marine science. Um, physical oceanography and uh, coastal ecology, um, and so in you know looking at the ROV as, as part of that package. Uh, I'm the director of a program here called the Innovation Lab, which is sort of a math and science academy uh, for advanced students when they're in the school who are interested in technology and engineering. Um, so from a technical standpoint, you know I'm interested in having my students hacking the thing and modding the thing and making sensor packages. Um, use a lot of um, you know portable sensor. Platforms like the Vernier system, um, you know, which is a small battery-powered data collection device that you can hook a pH sensor, a salinity sensor, or a dissolved oxygen sensor, whatever to. Um, so next year, I'm going to have my students working on waterproof enclosures for that sort of thing and integrate in with OpenRV. Um, but from an educator standpoint, um, you know, and looking at the the technology part of it, um, what I was thinking about is sort of the opportunity to develop. Uh, just a set of standalone curricular modules um, for teachers who uh, manage to wind up with one of these in their hands in the classroom, um, maybe aren't sure exactly what to do with it um, educationally, um, to put together a set of resources, a set of essentially uh, plug-and-play labs and activities that teachers could download uh, and have ready to go in their classroom uh, to put a tool like this to, to quick use. That's cool. So what... Um that's interesting. So, like, so you talk about modules. That that's that's interesting to me. Can you give me an example of like one or two of those that you well, actually like? Can think of? I mean, teachers, you know, especially public school teachers who are outrageously busy and don't have a whole lot of time to sort of invent their own curriculum. Um, they like, you know, when you go to, to science conferences like NSTA, National Science Teachers Association, or, or things like that. Um, they love stuff that's off the shelf. Uh, so, if there's a ten-page PDF about water quality. Uh, there's a 10-page PDF about, uh, about you know, uh, coastal environments uh, that they can pull and use with their 8th grade class, or maybe there's a version for 5th grade and a version for 8th grade and a version for 11th grade. Uh, and sort of pull these things and, and have an, an off-the-shelf activity, because I think a lot of them might be, okay, you know, a movie called submarine is a cool thing, but, but I don't really have the time to integrate that into my uh, science classroom, and I'm worried about tests and standards, and so... Uh, sort of the way off-the-shelf curricula packages like that usually work is um, not only are they ready to use, but there's documentation in there that explains how it's integrated with science standards and, uh, and things like that, so teachers can sort of justify um, the use of these things in their classroom. I mean, I'm lucky enough to teach at a private school where I have a lot of flexibility in my curriculum, but, uh, but uh, not all public teachers have that much. Does there seem to be much interest um kind of academically in not just technology and science as two separate things that should be taught, but specifically the link between the two, using technology to do science. Is there is there a, 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 a bit of curriculum that's already being pushed um, that is specifically about the, the combination of those two things? Yeah, I think there ha I mean, I think the, the maker movement is kind of leaking its way into schools at the moment, and I think there is actually a lot of interest in uh, combining the science uh, aspect of, well, just science class with the technology aspect of doing something hands-on and learning by doing and having an experiential learning uh, process where uh, it's not just uh, sitting in class and, and reading about marine biology in a book, but being 
you know, ankle deep in the water for a couple of days and, and you know, using something that you built yourself and you understand how it works. Um, I think there is a lot of interest in that. Um, but I think that, you know, like I said, for, for a lot of public school teachers, there's interest in that, but the framework in which they can execute that is relatively narrow. Uh, you know, maybe one day a semester uh, that they have free from um, all the other demands of their curriculum that they can do something extra. So, so one of the things that, that I think uh, that public science teachers really appreciate um, is sort of a, an off-the-shelf curricular solution that, that lays everything out for them that they can, they can execute. Um, and that sort of, that work of that integration of the science, the technology, uh, the, the process, you know, if there's a protocol for taking data or whatever, that work's already been done. So what, what about the, the sharing aspect? Because, you know, in our, in our experience, one of the most important things that we've learned personally is the value of sharing. Like just, just collaborating with people all over the world, and I think that's one of the biggest opportunities here with, with OpenRV is, is, is to collaborate. And um, I'm wondering if that fits into anything, anything that you're planning, or, or I don't know, maybe that's too broad an idea, but just kind of... It seems plausible that you know people could develop, they could build the ROV in one place, a different place could develop a payload that goes on the ROV, and yet a third, you know, another third place might be able to actually deploy the ROV, and a fourth place could pilot the ROV from somewhere else in the world. You know, things like this where different people are focusing on different things. Um, I mean, Open ROV is all about sharing the ideas and designs, so that collaborative element seems like a, a useful tool too. Yeah, and I think especially if 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 uh, if you're talking about uh, having students develop uh, water sampling or data collection payloads, um, having a, a, a sort of open forum where where teachers from you know two different places in the world, even two different places in the East Coast, can take data in the same week and compare you know what was the water temperature as a function of depth where you are, what's the water temperature as a function of depth where I am, what's the pH of the water. In North Carolina, with the pH of the water in Long Island Sound, and just to have that sort of exchange of real-world data that you've created yourself, I think it's something that that students, especially in the younger grades, don't really often get to do. Um, most of their data sort of comes prepackaged from lab experiments and aren't really experiments at all. Um, and so I think the the value of, of having a an environment where people can share, um, you know, the the, the data, well, and both the, the things that they create and the ideas that they come up with using it, but also the data that they collect it would be really valuable. So, the, so the, we, we've kind of talked about, so I think we're all familiar with the, the education system in the United States, but I'm interested to hear what, uh, in a lot of things, because most of these ROVs are actually going around the world. Um, mm -hmm. At least half of them are, are going out of the country. So I'm interested to hear from, from an international perspective what, what your thoughts are on, on incorporating it in the kind of education system. Ben, why are you still with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering if you were talking about me. Uh, I guess I'm the only international guy, so... Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, um, c can you repeat exactly the question, please? So, you know, this is, you know, we've kind of been, been um, you know, having this conversation is very, very US-centric. I mean, we're, we're thinking about our education system and ways that we can incorporate this, but I think the real opportunity is that the, um, the these open RVs are going all over the world, and I, I'm really curious to, to know, um, you know, from, from someone who's outside the United States, what the, what the, the draw is and what, they, what you see as the potential for using this class, classroom or in any kind of education. Well, um, to me, um, as I told you, I'm, I'm teaching in an engineering school. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have um, uh, a department which is dedicated to embedded systems, mm -hmm. and uh, they ho all the students have some options. Uh, some have some free time to do personal project. That is that is part of the part of the year. And I was thinking about uh, suggesting to work on the open RIV. To I don't know. Honestly, I didn't think about more than that. Uh, I just realized that it could be uh, some educational uh, stuff uh, when I saw the meeting, and I guess we could work uh, with the students during a year to to whether um, improve the embedded system, 
maybe expand uh, with new payloads. I, uh, I didn't think more than that. The issue to me would be probably that uh, it's a pure software uh, school, so all the mechanical and electronic parts um, we will we would have to, to to do it with some other com uh, school, mm -hmm. but um, you know ma many of the students this year were building qu um, quadricopters. I don't know why they wouldn't build uh, an open RV. Mm -hmm. We are we are a city on the sea and we have a strong uh, industry dedicated to sea, so it makes a lot of sense to to work on this kind of project. What level are most of the students that you work with at? I mean, are they, are they, um, you said they're mostly software people, right? They're not, they're not really doing mechanical design so much as software design, is, it? is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's it, because I'm in a software school. It seems so, like there's a lot of potential there. I mean, I, I'm not much of a software person myself, but when I've, um, you know, worked on projects like this, it's cool because you start out with, you know, a, a beagle bone and essentially uh, something that's like an Arduino, and you can you can kind of do very basic level programming, and then it gets progressively more interesting as you as you start leveling up to the point where we could have uh, you know computer vision um, systems that are recognizing objects um, or doing ob you know um, optical flow to detect speed and and things like that um, to control systems um, design um, that can be done. Both on the BeagleBone and Arduino side of things, um, I've thought of ideas of like uh, if you have a microphone on the USB webcam that has, you, you know, you can send video back, and maybe you could even do like you know acoustic-based anomaly management. There's a ton of really, I think, you know, groundbreaking stuff that could be done with a soft at the software level on OpenRV, um, as well as stuff that's a great kind of platform to learn from because it's you know it's it's an easy stepping stone to that. And so I'm really excited to start seeing people. Like how you're describing using using it to uh, to develop their own ideas. Hmm. You know, I would yeah. And w w what you mentioned is typically typically this kind of stuff we we could work on. Uh, you talked about the um, computer vision. Uh, I, myself, I got interested. I got interested in t into it and look at it. It's a pretty it's a pretty big big stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, um, that that's the kind of stuff we could. We could work on. Um, did you? Is there any group on on this specific subject, or? Well, we're trying to develop those sorts of discussions on our forums on OpenRV. You know, we have the the forum pages, and mm -hmm. um, right now there's been a few things where people kind of lightly touch on the idea. But we'd be extremely interested to start seeing that more kind of aggressively pursued. And all it really takes is someone saying kind of what their general thesis is, what their thought of of what they want to pursue is, and then. Especially, we found once people start giving a demo, even if it's a really crude first attempt, um, that's when people really start collaborating a lot. Um, so we haven't really done too much computer vision yet, um, but it's it's being developed. There's also some um, alternate bits of software that can be put on the ROV that um, use OpenCV, which is an open source computer vision platform. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is just the genesis of it right now. So the, the the thing is, for my students, the year is done right now. They will or they are all leaving for vacation, so all that will be discussed in the, uh, back to school in September. Well, we'd love to even at least hear um, what kind of the interest is, and and you know we'll try to connect the right people also, so that maybe there's even some prior art by the time they're ready to start looking at it. Yeah. So one and by by this time, mine should be finished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm glad I'm glad it made it through customs there. Um, so the uh, the one thing I, that keeps coming up in my mind is that, and this is not not just for open RV in, in education, but open RV in general is is people have all these kind of different uses for it, and it's so broad. I mean, there's there, it seems like there's actually so much that you could do, and someone and someone this one brought up this idea of this kind of inquiry based curriculum, where you really where you really set instead of having like right answers or right things to do, um, that the the entire curriculum is really based on asking great questions, and I think that's a really intriguing and interesting idea, especially when you think about Open RV, because if if you kind of put the the center of the 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 curriculum on you know encouraging those the students to ask great questions, then 
you know, the, the exploration and the, and the technology and the building up the different payloads um, could all extend from that. But it seems like it seems like it's we still we still need kind of those questions. Maybe some of them emerge as, as more engaging and more opportunistic for learning. But I'm, I'm wondering what you guys think of that idea of this kind of inquiry-based curriculum. Maybe it's what you guys already do on that. Uh, yes, I, personally, I, I really love it. The thing is, in France, we are much oriented to answer the right question rather than learn students to ask the right question. And yeah, and actually, sorry about that. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, so you just got me thinking about it because I, I hadn't thought about this before. But there's um, there's a uh, an institute out in Eleuthera in the Bahamas, the Cape Eleuthera Institute, that runs a high school program. That's kind of exactly what you're describing. It's a it's a marine focused, inquiry based sort of a boarding school program. It's obviously tailored to wealthier students, but um, they might be a good uh, test ground for um, trying out some of these kinds of curriculums. Um, they certainly have the resources to uh, to definitely do some trial and error. Cool. Zach, how much, is, how much of that idea is like part of what you do already? How much are you like sitting down with students going, all right, what do we want to learn? What, do, what, do you, what are you guys curious about? How much of Well, I, I think Good teachers and good faculty do that. I'm in a, a kind of unique position because I deal my the people I teach are faculty, so I'm one step removed from the the classroom, generally speaking. Um, but the people that I partner with are very much oriented in in that direction, as evidenced by the fact that they're willing to, you know, uh, you know, we got all this stuff not knowing, having really any idea what the right questions were, but knowing that if we got the platform rolling, that we'd be able to um, not only invite students to come up with those use cases, but um, so yeah. Well, I think that's the right spirit, and I hope that I hope that whatever happens, I hope that that kind of remains baked into the DNA. Is that that this isn't? We're not telling you what to do. We're just giving you an opportunity to, to ask a bigger question, to go a little bit further, and to see a little bit deeper. So, I don't know, Dave, what what do you think about that? Is that is that kind of fit with what you're? With what you're planning, or do you have some, kind of a more? Yeah, I mean, it runs the gamut for me. I mean, for my for my sort of program within the school of the the uh, sort of math and science academy, it's I view it as, as completely open ended. You know, here's an ROV. What are you going to do with it? Um, you know, when thinking about how to apply that uh, to the sort of the the grade level experiences. You know, uh, when I hand it over to the seventh and eighth graders in the junior science program, if I hand it over to the students in uh, one of the marine science electives. Um, I think it may be a little more constrained than that, but I still think, I mean, I still think the best uh, experience for students to have would be something inquiry-based, you know, to have them figure out what are the questions I could ask and answer um, about, you know, what's going on uh, 100 feet down in the Long Island Sound, uh, and how could I answer those questions with uh, the tools that I have available, be they cameras or microphones or, or, or you know, uh, cage meters or whatever. Um, so I think that that's that's the absolute ideal is to make technology of, like this part of or embedded in a sort of authentic uh, inquiry-based research question um, for students. Um, you know, I have the luxury to be able to do a lot of that, being a sort of an independent lab school where we're not constrained by any curricular uh, notions other than our own. Um, so that's easy for me to do, and, and sort of as a lab school, part, the other part of what I see is, is our job to do is to take the results of that and to sort of pre-digest them a little bit um, for teachers and students who might not have that much time, who might not have time for a two-week inquiry process. Maybe they only have time for a two-day inquiry process. Yeah. Um, maybe they only have time for a one-day, let's drive this thing around and, and ask some questions without really the opportunity to answer those questions. Um, so I think it comes at a bunch of different levels, from the sort of extended inquiry-based project to the um, to the all the way down to the fairly cookbooky, you know, lab report kind of uh, experience, which is not the ideal, but you know, for a lot of students, is is uh, is uh, you know better than than what they would get otherwise. So uh, I'm interested in, in that whole spectrum. Okay. That's awesome. Cool. So I. 
I don't want to take up too much time. I really just wanted to, to use this opportunity to get a conversation started. So what I'm going to do, and I just thought of this now, is I'm just going to start a new. And Zach and Zach and I had tried to get uh, a group going on the on the forums at one point, but I think it'd be a good time to to re to re uh, try that effort. So what I'm going to do is create a, a whole new category in the forum just around education, and I'd love. You know, for you guys to, to post ideas there. Zach, if you want to post your, your whole build and how that thing's going, that would be great. Um, Dave, any of these uh, these modules that you're working on or, or any of the projects that you guys are doing with this kind of marine size department, even if it's not directly using the RLD, we'd love to hear about and follow along with what you're doing. Right. And, and, and uh, Andrew, if you want to introduce to, the, to that school, that would be great. Or if we can. Yeah, I, I'll um I'll send them a message and and yeah. put you guys in touch with them. Cool. I'm just FYI, I've been keeping a notes, a shared notes for this, and oh, so yeah. it has all the links, um, even th not just the ones in the chat, but the, that institute. And I also link to e uh, the NGSS, which in California is a big deal in the STEM thing. But to the extent that any modules map to, uh, I'm in a lot of STEM and STEAM conversations out here, and right. you know the big effort is to map those to science standards so that people, uh, teachers especially in K through 12, can just kind of, you know, do pre-justify that stuff for yes, them. Yeah, we got to do that. Um, okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll post this video. I mean, this is going to be a YouTube video in like 10 minutes. So uh, I'll post this to the, the blog. And if you want to add those notes to it there, or actually I can post it in the, in the new forums that we, that we create. So I'll do that. Perfect. All right. Well, thank Great. you all so much for your for your time. Um, I look forward to doing this again soon. It's a pleasure to meet Thanks. all of you. Yeah, it was great meeting, guys. Yes. <laughs> pleasure to meet. Bye, bye, guys. Yeah.